I ask people all the time, so define what does differentiation mean? And everybody inevitably says to be different. And I always say, then if that were true, then why don't you show up in a clown suit? It's not about being different. There's a lot of things that are different. Just because you're different doesn't mean that you add value. It's time to get inside your own head. Begin with the psychology behind your behaviors and fuse it with an acute understanding of self-awareness, emotion, storytelling, body language, and more. Then look at it all through the lens of the latest neuroscience research, broken down to its most digestible form. And you've arrived. Enhanced messaging, deeper connection, heightened influence, and a greater impact on the world. Welcome to the neuro side of influence and leadership with Rene Rodriguez. All right, welcome to another episode of the neuro side of leadership and influence. In today's topic, we're going to talk about differentiation strategies. And that actually comes from a, a broader topic called competitive strategy. And if you're listening to this, you're probably in a competitive situation or a competitive market of some sort. And if you're in business, you are competing. And so this fits into how you compete in the marketplace. And we're going to talk about all that. So I'm, I'm excited because this is something that I have talked about for a long, long time. And it's not something that people talk about. They, they talk about it but I don't know if they always understand it. And so I kind of want to unpack it. I want to go deep on it. And I want to give you some new ways of thinking about it and also see how it applies in, in terms of leadership influence. I want to talk about some of the science behind it. And I want to I think from just some different angles here. And so the first thing is, of course, what we always do is let's define some terms. I ask people all the time, so define what does differentiation mean? And everybody inevitably says to be different. And I always say, then if that were true, then why don't you show up in a clown suit? It's not about being different. There's a lot of things that are different. Just because you're different doesn't mean that you add value. And so let's go back to, if you haven't listened to the previous podcast, I try to make these things sort of play off of each other if you haven't figured that out yet. And so go back to start with the first one. These things sort of build, but also they stand alone. But you, you can't just be different. There's a great visual image, and I'll see if we can't put a link in the show notes, of an axe that's made out of wood, but it's different. The handle isn't made out of wood. The actual axe head, the sharp part, is made out of wood. Very different, just of no value. And so you're not going to cut anything with that. It should be made out of metal and the handle out of wood. Just because you're different doesn't mean you're going to be valuable. And so the... Differentiation is a very unique thing, and I have never run up against anybody that has this definition I'm going to give you right now, because this, I think, to me, is the best definition. Differentiation is the ability to persuade people or to sell your product or service without having to lower its price. I'm going to say that again. The ability to sell your product or service without having to lower its price. Think about what that means. If you can sell your product or service and you don't have to lower its price, that means that there are no other different op options out there. You are so different. You are so unique that nobody, they don't have another choice. And so when people talk about, well, we want to be different, but yet they're out there giving discounts, that means that you have to use a marketing manipulator like a discount to convince people to buy because you don't want them to buy somewhere else. And so just by giving a discount, you're already putting yourself in a position to choose a different competitive strategy. And so you, you gotta be very honest with yourself about what strategy it is that you're using when it comes to that. And so differentiation is very, very, very unique. When it comes to in economics, and here's a mouthful that I'm gonna give you, in economics, the whole concept of competition is the rivalry among sellers trying to achieve goals such as increasing profits, market share, and sales volume by varying elements in the marketing mix. So that would be price, product, distribution, and promotion. When they're competing, they're competing in all of those areas. And all of us basically were competing, if you're in, in a direct sales environment, if you're selling something, you're competing to who gets the next sale. And that, that's it's kind of a short-sighted view of things. You're, you, you should be thinking a little bit further. 
beyond that. You should be thinking about what's coming down the pipe, what's happening in your market, what's happening in a technology standpoint. What are the factors that are playing into the long-term interest rates? What's happening? What are the trends that are affecting you? Because the trends are going to affect sales coming to one year, two years, three years, five years for you. What are the new entrants in the marketplace? But it's hard when you're thinking about the next sale and what's happening you know, from your next paycheck because you'll think, well, I'll think about that stuff later. I got to go make a sale. But this will help you with all of that because if you can differentiate yourself, you can find a way to stand out a little bit differently in such a way that you don't have to lower your price as much or at all, that it'll help everything. All of this comes down to this question of how do I compete? And let's go back to this this beginning phase of this. And I want you to go back and I want to take you back to this guy by the name of Michael Porter. Michael Porter was named one of the 50 most influential, probably was named actually the most by uh, Fortune Magazine, the most influential business mind or business professor, excuse me, that ever lived. And so he's a Harvard business at Harvard Business School. But Fortune said he's the most influential. And he wrote a book called Competitive Strategy. It's a huge, thick book. And he also coined the term competitive advantage. And so think about it. If you've ever turned, well, what's your competitive advantage? You're, you're quoting Dr. Michael Porter. And within that, he talked about how do you have a competitive advantage, but there's another deeper concept within that called a sustainable competitive advantage. And we're going to dive into a little bit about that concept of sustainable, right? Sustainable is where you want to get at. Competitive advantage is okay, but sustainable is where you want to be. And so what he said in there, that there's only three ways that you can compete. The first one is through being the lowest price. Think Walmart, right? It's pretty hard to beat Walmart. They beat up their suppliers and they beat up everybody. You're not going to find a much cheaper price than Walmart. And so that's the first one. Second way is through a niche or a focus. Valvoline is one. You know, in our area, we used to have this thing called rapid oil change, right? You can fix a car in a lot of ways, but they said, we're only going to change the oil. And the third was, if you remember this place called Rainforest Cafe, they did through differentiation. And so they had a restaurant, but they said, we're going to make it so different and unique here that they didn't have to lower their price. In fact, their prices were horrendously high and their food was actually horrible and their service was horrible. Wait times were horrible, but they didn't matter. It was so different. The unique, the experience was so different. Now they went out of business, so it's probably a pretty horrible example. But it was different. So we're going to cover some other examples there that are more modern, but I wanted you to get a sense of what we're talking about. So when we're thinking about those elements, going back to this concept of sustainable, technology isn't always sustainable because a lot of times you can just write a check and somebody else can do that. Your product isn't sustainable. Recently, I, I, I do a lot of work, obviously, in the mortgage industry, and I remember there was an increase in the amounts uh, for a jumbo mortgage. And I remembered one side of the community was saying, going crazy, wow, we got a chance to do the jumbo loans at this rate for, you know, because one side, other side of the industry couldn't do it and they got so excited. And one bank said, well, hold on, we can't do that. They made a few phone calls and literally the next day they all had it too. And you realize that that was a competitive advantage for less than 24 hours. And you start to realize that those aren't competitive advantages. They're not sustainable because people can replicate them. And so when you're talking about distinct capabilities, you're thinking of things that are going to be sustainable, intellectual property rights, that's, that's sustainable, right? That's uh, you know, exclusive li licenses, monopolies. But guess what? Most people don't have those, right? And so reproducible things that are not sustainable, technological capabilities, financial capabilities, marketing capabilities, uh, knowledge, those aren't sustainable, but people think they are. But now, what is sustainable? Having a strong brand. We get into personal branding. I can't stress it enough, the importance of personal branding today. You have to invest in it. You have to figure out who you are in this place, what you believe. You got to put some money behind it. You got to put some effort behind it. Leadership. God, what a difficult thing to replicate. A good, strong leadership team, people that care, uh, a strong vision. 
organizational culture, the true culture that communicates well. When you walk in, you go, wow, what is this place? That is a, is, is a sustainable one. That's hard to replicate. Business processes. You ever, you ever work for a place that just had horrible processes? And you go somewhere else and things are just smooth? That's a sustainable advantage. Partnerships. When you go into a place where you just like, you've got great lead partnerships, you've got things that just happen smoothly, those are, are sustainable. So those are the things you want to go after. And so when you start thinking about it from that perspective, this whole concept of how I compete in the marketplace, do I want to be the lowest cost provider? Well, if you're providing discounts, that's your choice. Now, I'm not saying it's a bad thing. It definitely is a very viable way of competing. You just know that the lower you lower your price, the less margin you have, and the more sales you have to make to make up for it. So you have to increase your workload to be able to in- make the, make up the income loss, right? So there's always a give and a take. And what ends up happening a lot of times is if there's not as much margin, you have to work harder. Service levels sometimes suffer. It, you just don't have as much money to invest. You have to go make up in volume. I mean, there's a, there's, it, there's a lot of complexities in that. And if you don't plan on increasing volume and you're lowering your margin, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. Again, this is called strategy, which strategy implies that you're looking at all angles. If this, then that. You're trying to, it's like a chess game. You're trying to think three, four, five, 10, 15 moves ahead. So all of these are viable strategies. You just have to decide which one's yours. And so let's play a little game. We're going to start four brands, four companies. And I want you to see if you can guess what brand we're starting. So the first one is we're going to start a, an ice cream brand. And our marketing strategy is we're going to open up posh ice cream parlor shops and we're going to get featured on the menus of high-end restaurants. Can you think about what brand comes to mind when we think about that? If you're thinking haagen you are correct. So that's how haagen started. We're, they open up these really f- swanky, posh ice cream parlor shops, and they went to the nicest restaurants they could, and they said, taste this ice cream. Think of the quality of the cream that we used and the flavors and even the, the names and everything, and it says we're going to exclusive in these fine dining restaurants, and they position themselves as being this amazingly high-quality ice cream, and that's how they got their start. And so that was haagen And so now we're going to start a chocolate company. But we're going to do that by building a theme park. And we're going to focus on just one product, a chocolate egg. And we're only going to sell that egg around one holiday, and that's Easter. And if you're guessing Cadbury, ding, 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 you are correct. And so Cadbury said, we're going to have just a focus. We're going to focus on one product, and we're going to build a theme park. Again, something very, very different and very, very unique. And it grew and grew and grew. And the next one that we're going to start, we're going to st- start, a, start a skin and body care retail- retailer. But the way that we're going to do this is we're going to focus on social causes. We're going to say that we're talking about being against animal testing. We're going to support c- local and community trade. We're going to activate self-esteem. We're going to defend human rights. And we're going to protect our planet. If you're thinking the body shop, Yes, you are correct as well. And so here is something that is totally different, that the body shop during their time rose and skyrocketed to the top. And the last one, we're going to start a circus. Now, at the time that we're starting the circus, we've got two big incumbents. We've got Shrine Circus and we've got Ringling Brothers, basically giving their tickets away for free in hopes that people will buy concession stand sales and maybe some swag and some T-shirts and some hokey little gifts. And that's basically how they make their money. But we're going to do it differently. We're going to eliminate star performers. We're going to eliminate all animals, so we don't have to worry about PETA. Uh, We're going to eliminate aisle concessions and sales because it just seems a little cheesy. We're going to make it immensely more expensive. We're going to lower our cost by because we're going to host it in parking lots. And we're going to, let's see what we can do, increase the, the experience by adding live music. What did we just start? Of course, Cirque du Soleil. So all four of those examples had a couple things in common. One, none of them are U.S. corporations because U.S., at the time of all of these, had a mass mass marketing 
uh, sort of access. We billboards, TV, radio, all of that. And outside the United States, it's not the same in terms of marketing. And so they had to do something very unique. But the other thing that they had is they all followed a concept called Blue Ocean Strategy. And Blue Ocean Strategy talks about four questions creating what they called a new value proposition. And they talked about what do we create, what do we eliminate, what do we reduce, and what do we increase. Those four questions are what create a value proposition. So Cirque du Soleil, what did they, re- they, re- they eliminated star performers. Why did they do that? So they could perform these shows worldwide without saying, well, Joe Blow over here can only be in one city at a time. No, if they wear masks and face paint, it doesn't matter. They can be all over the place. They eliminated animals because those were expensive. They were legal issues, and they, it just wasn't a good PR thing. And aisle concession stand sales. It just was something that just took down the experience. It wasn't as posh and as nice, and it would bring ticket, uh, ticket prices down. And, of course, having to deal with unions and being in, inside of these big venues was expensive, and they said, well, give us your parking lot. We'll put up a big tent, and we'll do it that way. And so they followed that, and that kind of led them to this uncontested market space. And the reason they call it Blue Ocean as opposed to Red Ocean, the Red Ocean is where all the competitors are, and they're out there slitting each other's throats you know, for lower costs and everything, and it's the, there's so much blood being spilled that the ocean is red, and the Blue Ocean is where there's no competition. It's an uncontested marketplace. And so the goal of that is to not try to beat your competition, but instead make your competition irrelevant. And so well, I want you to th- think about this. I'm going to give you one more example of a wine that in this company brand that I thought was just fascinating as a case study for this because it's something that, that all of us, I think, can take something from. It's yellowtail wine. Whether you like yellowtail wine, whether you drink wine or not, I think this is a fascinating case study because they went through what do they eliminate, what do they raise, what do they reduce, and what do they create questions. And they became the fastest growing highest selling wine in history. And so what did they eliminate? Well, they eliminated the terminology and the distinctions. What they found out was that most human beings cannot determine what a wine tastes like. And so they made it really, really easy to identify. They said it's just easy. So what did they reduce? Wine complexity. There's a red and a white the aging qualities, they eliminated that stuff. Uh, and they, what did they raise? Price versus budget wine. So they uh, raised retail store involvement. They reduced wine complexity. They reduced wine range. And they, had, uh, they also reduced vineyard prestige. They just they didn't care about all that stuff. So what did they create? Easy drinking, ease of selection, and fun and adventure. They just said, here's a red and here's a white. They also increased the sugar content so it was sweeter just easier to drink, not by a lot, but enough. And so this wine, I mean, when I say took off, it took off and sold more in a short period of uh, time than wines that have been around for, I don't know, hundreds of years. And so that whole concept, this is how I look at it. And if if you're listening to this, I would look at it from two perspectives. I would ask myself those four questions from a client's perspective and from our own business. So how does that work? I would go for our clients as a value proposition, what do we need to reduce, eliminate, create, and raise? Okay, and we would say all of those things. And then that becomes your value proposition. Now, in order to achieve that, what do we need to reduce, eliminate, create, and raise? And that becomes our strategic plan, what we need to do in order to achieve our value proposition. If you look at it from that perspective, here's our value proposition. And to deliver a value proposition, we need to reduce, eliminate, create, and raise. And that's external. But to be able to become that internally, we need to reduce, eliminate, create, and raise things as part of our strategy. And so looking at those two side by side, you start seeing how they sort of play off of each other and how we could pull them together. Differentiation strategy, fitting a part of this sort of broader competitive strategy. Where do you find yourself? Are you just out there saying, what's my next deal? What's my next event? What's my next promotion? 
because competitive strategy goes way further than just selling a product. I mean, this is competitive strategy in terms of leadership and who's getting promoted, who's going to get the budget, this limited budget. Are you able to make the case? Are you able to influence those that are holding the purse strings, the bigger partnerships, all of those elements? And so I want you to think about it from your perspective on how this applies. So thank you for tuning in today. Again, find us on our Facebook group, ask questions, please continue to engage. I absolutely love doing this. This has been an absolute fun time. Please buy our book, amplifybook.com. It's Amplify with two eyes. Go go to meetrene.com and you'll see all the links there. Continue to like, share, subscribe, all that stuff. The comments and and the feedback has been fantastic. So we really, really appreciate you, you tuning in. And if you would, Uh, Take a look at our AmpCon Live, or excuse me, AmpCon 2022 in Las Vegas on March 14th, followed by Momentum Builder on 15th and 16th at at, uh, Caesars Palace. All three events in a row at uh, Caesars Palace Resort and Casino in Las Vegas. It's going to be a great time. So if you're there, uh, register, use code Renee 100 on both events, and you'll save 100 bucks on mine. So right now. It's three ninety five a person after your code's an early bird special, which is going away very soon, by the way. So thanks for tuning in, and we will see you here each and every week. Take care.